The second section of the Chapter 9 lecture is titled Market Society, and the focus question to underpin this section is how did the market revolution spark social change? Even though cotton agriculture in some sense commercialized the South, it did not create a dynamic and diversified economy. Cotton plantation slavery simply spread the agrarian, slave-based social order of the eastern states westward. The cotton kingdom remained rural, and the South's transportation and banking systems were underdeveloped arms of the plantation economy. Manufacturing and technological development lagged there compared to the North. The market revolution transformed the North into an integrated economy of commercial farms and manufacturing cities. The pioneer stage of moving westward reinforced farmers' self-sufficiency because of the tasks of settlement left little time for market-based agriculture. Once the Old Northwest became more settled, however, farmers were drawn into the market economy linked to eastern centers of commerce and banking by increasingly developed transportation networks. Goods previously produced at home were now more often bought in stores, and more concentration was placed on producing crops and livestock for market rather than subsistence. The cities of the East became a market and source of credit for Western farmers. Banks and insurance companies financed land acquisition, supplies, and in the 1840s and 1850s, new types of mechanized equipment. The steel plow invented by John Deere in 1837 made it possible to rapidly cultivate large areas of western prairie land. Cyrus McCormick invented the reaper in 1831, which allowed for a large increase in the amount of wheat a farmer could harvest. Thousands were in use by the Civil War, and from 1840 to 1860, the country's wheat output tripled. Unlike cotton, the crop was primarily consumed in the United States. Much of it sold to eastern farmers who transferred their efforts to dairy, fruit, and vegetable production for nearby urban centers. Cities were part of the West from its beginning. Cities that stood at the intersection of interregional trade, such as Cincinnati, a center of pig slaughterhouses, and St. Louis, grew enormously and quickly. Chicago was the West's greatest city. Thanks to the railroad and its location on the Great Lakes, Chicago by 1860 was the fourth largest city in the nation, serving as a center where Western farm products were collected and shipped east. Urban centers in the West and East experienced great changes wrought by the market revolution. The number of people in cities increased dramatically. Urban merchants, bankers, and master craftsmen exploited the expanding market among commercial farmers. Their efforts to increase production and reduce labor costs transformed work. Skilled artisans who once made an entire product at home, where they controlled their own work, were now gathered in large workshops where entrepreneurs supervised them, subdivided their tasks, and paid them a wage to perform only one process in production. These workers faced relentless pressure from employers to make more goods faster, at lower wages, and under intense supervision. In some industries, particularly textiles, factories entirely replaced traditional craft production. Factories gathered large groups of workers under central supervision and replaced hand tools with power-driven machinery. The first factory in America was established in 1790 at Pawtucket, Rhode Island, by Samuel Slater, an English immigrant who built from memory a spinning jenny in order to evade laws making it illegal to export plans for industrial machines. These early spinning factories produced yarn, which, through the outwork system, was then sent out to rural farm families who wove it into cloth. The same outwork system characterized early shoe production, in which parts were sent out to families who assembled them and gave them back to merchants who sold the shoes. But shoemaking and textiles were eventually brought under one factory roof. The first large American factory that used power looms to weave cotton cloth was built in Waltham, Massachusetts in 1814. Beginning in the 1820s, other manufacturers established factories in Lowell and other small towns, creating small industrial towns and cities across New England. The first factories, powered by waterfalls and river rapids, were matched by the 1840s by factories using steam power, which could be located anywhere. In 1850, factories made not just textiles and shoes, but a wide variety of goods, including tools, firearms, clocks, and agricultural machinery. The American system of manufacturers relied on the mass production of interchangeable parts that could be quickly assembled into standardized, finished products. 
This was first practiced and perfected in clock production by Eli Terry of Connecticut and small arms production by Eli Whitney. An impressive array of mechanical skills was dispersed across northern society with towns often having sawmills, paper mills, ironworks, shoemakers, hat makers, tailors, and various other small enterprises. The early Industrial Revolution was largely confined to New England and a few cities outside it. The South, with its slaveholding class generally opposed to industrialization, lagged far behind in factory production and the development of an internal market. Outside New England, most work was still carried on in small, unmechanized workshops. Here's something interesting to think about. The market revolution actually changed Americans' conception of time itself. Farming still relied on seasonal rhythms, but in cities, clocks became a part of daily life with work and leisure time clearly separated from one another. That's not the way things always were. During the colonial era, bouts of intensive work were alternated with periods of leisure. But the market revolution brought work schedules based on production for specified hours per day. Workers' pay became increasingly separated from the product itself and based on a daily or hourly wage. Railroads also operated on a set schedule, making Americans more conscious of life on, quote, clock time, unquote. Few native-born men were attracted to factory employment because they viewed closely supervised work for a set time as a violation of the independence that defined their ideas of American freedom. Employers turned to those who lacked other ways of earning a living. Most early New England factories first used female and child labor. In Lowell, Massachusetts, the best-known center of early textile manufacturing, Employers built an entire town with churches, lecture halls, and boarding halls in order to convince farm families to allow their daughters to leave home for work. Though the constant supervision was highly restrictive, this was the first time that women were sent into the public world in large numbers, and most valued the opportunity to earn money at a time when few other jobs were open to women. The mill girls, as they were called, were a transient labor force, meaning they didn't stay in position for long, since most sought to marry after only a few years of factory work. By the 1840s and 1850s, immigrant labor eased the shortage of industrial workers when large-scale immigration from various regions of Europe began. Economic growth fueled a demand for labor, which was partly filled by immigrants. Immigration swelled between 1840 and 1860 when over 4 million people came to the United States, mostly from Ireland and Germany. Modernization of agriculture, the Industrial Revolution, and steamship and rail transportation spurred many of these migrants to America. Most went to the north, where jobs were plentiful and they would not face competition from slave labor. Very few immigrants went to southern states, except for peripheral cities such as New Orleans, St. Louis, or Baltimore, but immigrants in both northern cities and rural areas were quite visible. The introduction of the ocean-going steamship made Atlantic crossings much cheaper, thus accelerating emigration from Europe to the United States, Canada, and Australia. Frequently, the first emigrant of a family to go was a male member who would work and send back money for the remainder of the family to follow. America offered political and religious freedom to Europeans living under repressive governments and rigid social hierarchies. But the largest number of immigrants fled catastrophe, such as the Irish men and women who escaped from the Great Famine of 1845 to 1851, when a potato blight starved one million Irish to death and caused another million to migrate, mostly to America. These migrants, having worked mostly in agricultural labor, moved into unskilled or low-skilled jobs. Men into common labor, rail and canal construction, longshore and factory work, and women into domestic service. The Germans were the second largest group of immigrants and tended to include more skilled workers such as artisans, craftsmen, and shopkeepers and formed tight-knit immigrant communities in the East and West. Additionally, some 40,000 Scandinavians emigrated to the United States, mostly settling on farms in the Old Northwest. Industrial expansion and the failed Chartist movement of the 1840s inspired many English workers to emigrate as well. While English immigrants were easily absorbed into American culture, the Irish faced bitter hostility. 
They were Roman Catholics in a mostly Protestant society with deep anti-Catholic traditions, and they increased the visibility and power of the Catholic Church. Irish immigrants in the 1840s and 1850s alarmed many native-born Americans, Nativists, who feared the impact of immigration on American political and social life, blamed immigrants for crime, political corruption, heavy drinking, and job competition that undercut wages for native-born skilled workers. The Irish were rapidly integrated into the Democratic Party's urban political machines, which dispensed jobs and poor relief to immigrants. Nativists applied similar stereotypes to the Irish that were directed against blacks, namely that the Irish in particular were a lazy, childlike, and irrational people unfamiliar with American ideas of liberty and subservient to the Catholic Church, thus threatening democratic institutions, social reform, and public education. Riots targeted immigrants and their institutions, and nativist politicians were elected in the 1840s and 1850s. Nativism did not become a national political movement until the 1850s, but a nativist mayor was elected in New York City in 1844. American law in this period increasingly supported the efforts of entrepreneurs to participate in the market revolution while protecting them from local governments and liability that might interfere with their activities. The corporate form of business organization, in which a corporate firm receives a charter from the government and stockholders are not individually liable for company debts, became central to economic life in this period. Corporations found reinforcement in Supreme Court decisions that validated their legal status, such as in Dartmouth College v. Woodward in 1819, which defined corporate charters issued by states as legally binding contracts, thus preventing future lawmakers from altering them or rescinding them. Then in Gibbons v. Ogden, five years later, the Supreme Court actually struck down a monopoly that had been granted by the New York legislature for steamboat navigation throughout that state's waters, allowing more corporations to engage in business, engage in, in commerce and navigation of those waters on the grounds that constitutionally only Congress had the right to regulate trade or regulate commerce. Meanwhile, at the local level, courts found businesses blameless for property damage and held that employers had full authority in the workplace, even using old conspiracy laws to convict workers who joined unions or went on strike. Only in 1842 did the Massachusetts State Court render a decision in Commonwealth v. Hunt, stating there was nothing inherently illegal in striking or unionizing. 